so it gives me great pleasure to introduce Juinderjit Singh, um, the Lord Singh of Wimbledon. Uh, he's uh, known as the man who brought Guru Nanak to the breakfast tables of Britain. He's an acclaimed journalist and broadcaster who is widely regarded as the voice of the British Sikh community. And so for many years, he's been a tireless campaigner for human rights, freedom of belief, and the alleviation of uh, poverty. Um, he's widely recognized as a leading pioneer of the UK interfaith movement and is director of the network of Sikh organizations and the editor of the Sikh Messenger. He became the first turban Sikh in UK Parliament when he became a member of the House of Lords in 2011. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to, uh, to invite uh, uh, Lord Singh uh, to address you today. Why Why The COVID pandemic makes it difficult and challenging time for all of us. It's depressing and frustrating to not to be able to visit loved ones and share love, affection, hopes, and concerns. We miss our Gurdwaras, where we go to pray and socialize. But as Sikhs, we have to be positive. And in the spirit of Charitikala, be optimistic and always forward thinking, even in difficult and challenging times. As Sikhs, we should take the current lockdown as an opportunity to pause and reflect in the direction of our lives, both as individuals and as a community. Have we got our priorities right? Or do we need to change direction? What do we need to do to make, as both individuals and the community, to live true to the teachings of Sikhism and work for a more power, uh, power peaceful and just society. We can, cannot in the short term meet in our gurdwaras, but we can use our enforced isolation to pause and look again at the Guru's teachings, rather than taking them simply as a background to our lives. We can only understand the value of our heritage by comparing the Guru's teachings with those of other faiths. And I've asked our sec General Secretary to circulate a brief questionnaire on the ethical teachings of different religions to put our Guru's teachings in their true perspective. Sadly, the world about us is anything but just and peaceful. We are all too aware of continuing conflict and gross inequalities in opportunity and social justice. A world in which the rich and powerful nations have become rich and powerful by exploiting others, as we've seen in the recent reaction to the police murder of Joy, George Floyd in America, with the Black Lives Unrest, Black Lives Matter Unrest, and the toppling of statues of slave traders and overt racists who were previously regarded as national heroes. But how can Sikh teachings help us to move from the iniquities of the past to help us in working for a more caring society? Guru Nanak and his blueprint for a just society reminded us that self-improvement was necessary in working for a fair and just society. To this end, he gave us the injunction Nam Japo Kirtkaro and Wand Chakro. That is, meditate on God, earn by your own effort, and share your time and earnings with the less fortunate. How can this guidance for positive living help us in the world of today? Nam Japna or meditation is, doesn't mean sitting cross legged in abstract contemplation or chanting Wai Guru Wai Guru again and again. It means reflecting on Sikh teachings to get a sense of direction in our lives. Nam Japna requires us to reset our satnas to a gurmukh or godly direction, to help us distinguish the important from the tri trivial or negative pulls on our time and energy and make us more effective human beings. Sikhs, 
do not see religious contemplation as something divorced from the challenge of life. It means using religious guidance to meet those challenges more effectively. Guru Nanak explained the relationship of a holy or gurmukh person with wider society, with the example of the lotus flower, which having its roots in muddy waters, still flowers beautifully above. Similarly, Sikh should live and work in society, but always be above its meanness and its pettiness. Githkarna is closely linked with the third part of the injunction, one chakra. Share your good fortune with others. Distribution of langar is one aspect of this that has received very favorable prominence and media attention in the current pandemic, with reporting from the BBC on what the Sikhs are doing to feed others the needy in the lockdown. It's important to look at the earning and sharing of wealth in its modern perspective. Sikhism teaches there are two dimensions in life, the spiritual and material. Both are necessary for balanced living. What Sikhism does criticize is the blind obsession with material wealth and the current belief in both the East and the West that happiness and contentment are related to the accumulation of wealth and material possessions. The blind pursuit of happiness in this way can also lead to instability in society by ignoring the needs and rights of others on a national level, this is manifested in strikes and civil unrest. On an international level, the effects are even more serious. We see this in the economic greed that has led to the international trade in arms. Most industrial nations see the arms industry as an important earner of foreign exchange, as well as political leverage on the less development, developed world. In the, way, in the same way as we look with revulsion to the slave trade of the past, our children and grandchildren will look with equal revulsion and disbelief at a generation that's prepared to countenance and the continued suffering of millions of poor for, the, for their own economic prosperity. In a similar way, political and economic pressures have combined to produce a grossly inequitable distribution of wealth, with the industrialized power manipulating the price of raw materials and inflating those of manufactured goods in a way to keep the poor poor and make the rich richer. It is here that we have to remember the Guru's teachings of Kirt Karna and One Chakra, earned by your own effort. Now, the serving of Langa has been previously mentioned. This is simply one example of this. Not to look to the needy and not to, uh, is not only wrong in itself, but also a sure recipe for social and political instability. It's threatens not only the poorer nations, but in our shrink shrinking world, threatens the peace and stability of us all. Guru Nanak's threefold rule of Nam Japna, Kirt Karna, and One Chakna is a perfect example, to an example and guide to responsible living. Today, religion finds itself in the dark as a major cause of violence leading to a questioning of its relevance in today's society. Killing in the name of religion is nothing new. Guru Nanak himself, the founder of our faith, was a witness to the Mughal invasion of India and the atrocities against their mostly Hindu population. The Guru reflecting on the bigotry used to justify such killings put the blame firmly on the divisive packaging of religions, of competing faiths, 
a superior or exclusive that's God, or as some put it today, as the final revelation. It's this bigotry of belief that God is on our side, applauding all we do in his name, that has led to conflict in the past. And today, when allied to a sense of real or perceived injustice, provides a warped rationale to the suicide bomber. Kuranana bravely argued that the one God of us all, of all humanity, does not have favorites and is not the least bit interested in our different religious labels, but only in what we do to wait, make the world a better place. The Guru saw different religions as different paths to responsible living and taught the right of people to follow their own path. He was also too aware that standing up for the rights of others could mean putting your own life in peril. In the Shabbat Jin Prem Kelan Gachar, Sir Hak Gali Meriao, he reminds us that when we stand up for others, we put our own life on the line. Being true to Sikh teachings is not easy. It's much easier to state high ideals than live by them. To show the practicality of his teachings, Guru Nanak instituted a system of succession, with each successive guru living the teachings in different social and political times. And it was not easy. Guru Arjan IV of Guru Nanak's nine successors he asked the Muslim saint, Mia Mir, to lay the foundation stone of the Golden Temple to show his respect for the teachings of Islam. He also included verses of Hindu and Muslim saints in the Guru Granth Sahib, underlining Guru Nanak's teaching that no one faith has a monopoly of truth. Guru Arjan's courageous stand for respect for all faiths led him to being tortured and martyred by the Mughal authorities who saw Islam as the only true faith. Sikhs show no bitterness in commemorating the anniversary of the martyred guru, but true to Sikh teachings offer cool, refreshing drinks to passers-by of Sikh homes and gurdwaras in remembrance of the thirst and suffering of the martyred guru in the searing heat of an Indian June. To mark the 400th anniversary of the Guru's martyrdom in 2008, in 2006, the network of Sikh organizations gave out hundreds of cans of cool, refreshing cold drinks to astonished passers-by in London's Trafalgar Square, together with a leaflet explaining the Guru's respect for other faiths. To our surprise, not one of the leaflets was discarded by the clearly moved locals and visitors. Guru Tegh Bahadur, the night guru, gave his life defending Sikh, the Sikh commitment to religious tolerance. When he stood up for the rights of Hindus, those of a different religion to his own, to worship in the manner of their choice. He did this in the face of intense Muslim persecution. And he was publicly beheaded for his brave stand. Yet he gave a new and higher meaning to the concept of tolerance, which is all often taken, taken as well. I'll put up with what you say. That's not the Sikh meaning of tolerance. Guru Dek uh, Bahadur gave a much stronger meaning. That is the willingness to give your life for the beliefs of others. We all remember that it was Voltaire who said, I may not believe in what you say, but I will defend to the de death your right to say. Guru Nanak, almost a century earlier, gave this noble sentiment practical utterance. Misplaced religious zeal, however, is not the only cause of conflict in our troubled world. 
a few years ago, I did some work for Amnesty International, looking at genocide and human rights abuse in a number of different countries. And abuse which often involved unbelievable depravity. Almost as bad as the abuse itself was the realization that those who we learn to trust are often the perpetrators, police and soldiers, and even worse, priests and teachers, and previously friendly neighbors. Sikhs were painfully reminded of this in the genocide of 1984. Why do people behave in such ways? The sobering conclusion is that we imperfect humans have only a thin veneer of civilization that differentiates us from those we call savages. A veneer that's all too easily shed at a time when either through misplaced religious zeal or simply in the pursuit of power, we are persuaded to see others as lesser beings. How can we move our wayward human race into what Sikhs would call a gurmukh or more godly direction? Why has religion itself lost its sense of direction? The problem is that the ethical teachings of religion of different faiths are easily and extremely easy to state, but difficult to live by. It's hard to put others before self. It's hard to forgive. Lust and greed have their attractions. So we develop surrogates for true religious teachings. If once a week we sing or chant or listen to words of ethical guidance or perform rituals, build beautiful places of worship, and for many in other faiths, fast or go on pilgrimages, we can convince ourselves that we are following religious teachings. Guru Nanak was not impressed with such short cuts. He taught pilgrimages, penances, and ritual acts of giving or compassion are in themselves not even worth a grain of sesame seed. It's all too easy to look to the tropical trappings of religion rather than to live true ethical teachings. We have to walk the talk. We must live true to the guidance. Sikhism being a comparatively new religion has several advantages. We haven't had much time to invent rituals to take the place of ethical imperatives, but we're doing our best in this negative direction with supposed holy people telling us about the correct way to open and read the Guru Granth Sahib and interminable arguments over the holiness of sitting on the floor in Lunga instead of on tables or chairs or in Gupi. Or taking anti-Gurmuk pronouncements from the Akal Tak or from a growing number of sons Babas as the word of God. We must remember always to be true to the teachings of the gurus and the Guru Granth Sahib alone. No sons, babas, or other people claiming such wisdom. The vacuum created by this failure to focus on key religious teachings and the reduced influence of religion has been filled by the pursuit of material wealth. Society rightly rejected the so-called religious view that taught that sought spiritually, spiritual improvement and at the same time countenance suffering of the poor. Unfortunately, the pendulum has now swung too far and mankind is engaged in seeking happiness and contentment to, through the blind pursuit of material wealth to the utter neglect of the spiritual side of life. To me as a Sikh, much of the unhappiness in the world results from a failure to recognize that life has both spiritual and material dimensions. And if we neglect either of these, it will be to our ultimate regret. This fundamental truth was recognized by our gurus. 
we have the story of the miser Dunichan, who spent all his life amassing wealth until he was given a needle by Guru Nanak to take to the next world. It was only then that the penny dropped. You can take nothing, no material possessions into the next world. On another occasion, the Guru gently chided some so-called holy men who had left their families to go in the wilderness in a proud pursuit of God. The Guru told them that they were wasting their time, that God wasn't to be found in the wilderness, but in their homes, in looking to the needs of their families and wider society. Today, in our preoccupation, preoccupation with things material, we've forgotten the importance of balance between material and spiritual living, and as a result, have previously unheard of prosperity alongside escalating crime, rising alcoholism and drug dependency, loneliness, the homeless, and broken families, and other evidence of social deterioration. How can we move to long-term consideration? How can we make a more cohesive and caring society? Voluntary effort and increasingly government and other statutory effort are becoming more alert to social ills in society. But in focusing on problems rather than causes, we are looking through the wrong end of the telescope and seek to see the uh, look to the uh, maladies rather than the under, underlying causes, the symptoms rather than the underlying causes. If problems resulting from drug abuse take up too much time, we call for the legalization of drugs to free police time, rather than question why the use of drugs has increased. Increasing alcohol abuse, let's extend or abolish uh, licensing hours to spread the incidence of drunken or loutish behavior. Result, a huge rise in binge drinking. Too many people ending up in prisons. Let's curb sentencing power. power. Extend this line of thinking of looking to the wrong end of a problem, to the behavior of little junior who greets visitors to the house by kicking them in the shins. Solution, the sort of solutions we have, would be to issue the visitors with shin pads as they enter the front door. It's important to differentiate between two levels of behavior. The first is conforming behavior, living to social and political norms without questioning them. In the 1960s, it was common for shop windows to carry advertisements of accommodation to let, saying no dogs, blacks, or coloreds, or to deny or denying jobs to Sikhs wearing turbans. It was not against the law nor against the norms of society. The teachings of our gurus, on the other hand, frequently challenge such norms, like the lowly position of women in society at the time of the gurus, and a lowly position that is still continuing today in much of the world. See, teachings have nothing to do with conformity. Instead, they look to spiritual and ethical advancement for both the individual and society as a whole. This is particularly important because, because politics and the democratic process are geared to pandering to short-term popularity. And this can result in populist policies that do much long-term harm to society. In the immediate aftermath of the Second World War, the victorious nations set up the United Nations and the Security Council to save us from the horrors of future wars. Today, members of the so-called 
UN Security Council are responsible for 80% of the world's arm trade and the suffering of millions. Interestingly, the UN Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 states that to prevent future conflict, we must we must respect the equality in, uh, in the human rights of all members of our one human family. Can you recognize the striking similarity between that declaration and our Guru's teachings 400 years ago? Thank you, Guru. Today, we live in a world that has arrogantly discarded ethical teachings, and we are beginning to realize that we have done it almost irreparable damage to our environment, and to, we are living in a dangerously unstable world of gross inequalities of wealth and opportunity, and a continual, continuing denial, denial sorry, a continuing denial of human rights right across the world. It is probably worse now than it has been for many years. In, in the, any do-it-yourself activity, there's a saying that when all else fails, look to the instructions. People like me throw away the instructions and get on with it and then make a mess of do-it-yourself activities. Our Guru's teachings give us valuable guidance for balanced and responsible living. And in a world that has made a mess of its do-it-yourself efforts, I feel it's important that we now look at the Sikh book of instructions, that is, the teachings of the Gurus and the Guru Granth Sahib, for us for sane, balanced living in a fairer and more peaceful world. Why Grajika Khalsa? Why Grajika Khalsa? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now, uh, if anyone would like to ask a question, there is a chat system built into uh, the software. If you can try and um, use that. Otherwise, try to put your hand up and I will try to, to come to you. Um, if it's okay, I, I would just like to start off um, with a question um, of my own. Um, obviously, most of us here uh, listening today have, uh, are Sikhs and have followed the Sikh philosophy. Um, and uh, we, I mean, most Sikhs feel that it obviously is the best philosophy for us to follow. Um, but uh, why do you think that uh, the Sikh philosophy has not really spread much more uh, widely around the world? As Sikhs, we have inherited a wonderful philosophy, balanced teachings, but we do not recognize their value. That's why I would say again and again, please do your own research on that um, tick box uh, sheet that I gave out. Don't take anything for granted. Do your own research. Look at the um, actual teachings. I I find it easier. I find uh, non-Sikh people are more ready to accept Sikh teachings than um, Sikhs themselves. It, it, it is amazing. It reminds me that of a person who went into a room and saw a beautiful painting on a wall, and the people living in the house were ready to sell it in the jumble set. He looked at it and recognized it as a priceless Rembrandt. And it takes someone from outside to come and realize and look uh, understand the value of what we possess. And so often it is people from outside. I once got up at an interfaith meeting to explain something from a Sikh perspective. And then someone got up after me and said, why is it that we haven't heard of these wonderful teachings before? And I smugly reply, oh, Sikhs don't proselytize. And he got up again and told me off and said, you should be ashamed of yourselves. You've got a wonderful gift, a wonderful background religion, and you're just keeping it to yourself. We're too busy squabbling over trivials, as I mentioned, how to sit in the boudoir, 
uh, well, are we an ethnic group? Or, uh, little things all the time, rather than concentrating on and, and realizing what wonderful guidance we have. Guru Nanak himself traveled widely to share those teachings. We, by chance, are now in the Western world, but we're still not sharing those teachings properly with others. So we all have the ability in our workplace or wherever we are to explain Sikh teachings in their true perspective. Good. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. and Mrs. Jeddah, who seem to have a question. If you can unmute and ask your question. Yes. Thank you very much for a very illuminating talk. Uh, I think you've partly answered what I was going to ask and also what Mr. Basin has said, that most of us listening to your lecture today know about our Sikh values and our philosophies. However, um, what I find is that 500 years ago, those philosophies and values were given to us by our gurus. And yet we as Sikhs have made very little progress in um, really teaching the younger generation or ourselves those values. We've been far too busy gathering or living in this materialistic world and we've forgotten the, uh, the main message that Guru Nanak gave of oneness. Now, how do you think we can turn the wheels behind to those 500 years ago when our gurus tried to preach those values? Because those are the values that are really relevant in today's world, as you suggested. They are absolutely valuable and it is really um, incumbent on each one of us to mm -hmm. try and let others be aware, make others aware of those values. Um, th there's a poem, it reminds me of a short poem that you cannot choose your battlefield, that God does for you, but you can plant a standard where a standard never flew. Wherever we are, whatever do we, we do, we can make a stand for the values of Sikhism. It is those values. We don't have to say everyone should be a Sikh. We have to stress the values as guidance, essential guidance for our troubled world today. Good. Um, okay. I think we have another question from uh, Gentle Chowdhury, please. If you'd like to unmute and ask the question. Sorry, Gentle Ji, if you can unmute. The Sikh religion, uh, based on regeneration of mankind, owning and caring the Mother Earth, and no promised land for anybody, um, where does the demand for ethnicity comes from? I know you successfully uh, defended or opposed the, this act. Where are we now and where, how can we you know, really help our youth not to be, you know, persuaded which are anti-Sikh principles. Yes, that in the, um, in, in the 1980s, um, there was a boy, a boy who went to school, I'll give a brief summary, who went, wanted to go to a school wearing a turban, who was told you can't. It's against the school uniform. And we fought a case um, to allow him to do so. At that time, the Race Relations Act of 1976 didn't protect religion, but we managed to say that most Sikhs at that time came from Punjab and could be counted as an ethnic group. Now, since then, the world has changed. We've got the 2010 Act, which gives total protection to all religions, and we don't need that um, fudge of ethnicity to protect our religion, but some people have been pressing, no, call ourselves an ethnic group, because they say if we call ourselves an ethnic group, we could be recognized as a nation and we can get Khalistan. It is naive and silly. If we've got a wonderful religion, we should say that we are Sikhs with pride. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's answered the question. I think uh, thank you to you, really. I mean, you saved us 
from this agony of being, you know, laborless ethnic group. Yeah, Thank that, you that, very that, much. That, that, there's actual danger in that. Yeah, the, I absolutely agree. There's a danger because uh, if we say that uh, Sikhs are an ethnic group, an, um, an employer can say, I've got the right number of um, ethnic Sikhs in the company while he's discriminating against visible identity Sikhs. And that is not what we call the case. I, I think we all will be very grateful to you being our Lord there. I know Lord Ranger is also, you know, quite vocal against such thing. I think we need level-headed people to really, you know, embrace the doctrines of Sikhism behind the whole thing. You know, if we regenerate the mankind, we just do not want to distinguish. We own the whole earth. We don't want to have a land of our own. We, know, we were never promised a land. We were never... The world is our own. We want that's, the that's world. It. To, now, we to are a global people. society. And, you know, uh, you touched upon armed trade, slave trade, and sadly, you know, um, members of the Security Council yeah. uh, are the perpetrator of, uh, you know, arm race, which, which is very sad indeed. Uh, and is there maybe, you know, you can use your position in the House of Lord to say like, look, you know, if you are promoting that arm race, you can't be in the Security Council. Well, it's interesting you say that because it goes back to, um, it's difficult to stand up for principles, but I've been doing that. There was a debate on the defense, uh, defense budget and everyone was praising the wonderful contribution of Britain and the West to uh, keeping peace. And I got up to a stunned house and said, what peace? And mentioned these statistics. And um, so you can make, uh, I, I go around making enemies everywhere. <laughs> that I've uh, defended Christians against persecution, Muslims against persecution. Not just trying to do what the Guru taught us to do. Well, thank you very much being there. I think, you know, at your young age, you look very healthy. Thank you very much. And <laughs> no, I, so yeah. our prayers are with you. And hopefully you, you know, carry on with your sane mind, writing and, you know, debating things in the House of Lord. Um, over to you, Bupinder. Is there anybody else? Yeah. I uh, can I just add one thing? Yeah. Though you can't see me, I don't know yeah. something wrong with camera. Anji, all, all I can say in Sikhism, we need unity. Everyone has to be all together. Yeah, you are right. I think I can see you. But... <laughs> well, can you see me? No. <laughs> yes, yes. That yes. uh, you are absolutely right that we do need unity. Now, what is happening is one group will say that we're in charge of everything, follow us. Another group will say, no, it's us. Now, that's not the way to unity. There is an easy way to unity. That is to unify and give a total pledge to be uh, loyal to the teachings of the gurus and the Guru Granth Sahib and no other person or group. If we do that, we will get unity. When I started the network of Sikh organizations, there were groups hopping up all over the place uh, that we are going to lead the Sikh community. With the network of uh, Sikh organizations, we don't pretend to be leaders. We are the network of Sikh organizations. It just facilitates cooperation in education, in the prison service, in uh, all or different ways in uh, the armed services. It brings people together to keep on the same right lines of Sikhism. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good. We've got a question from uh, Manjeet uh, Shi. If you can. Uh... Yeah, you can ask your question That's now. Sasri Kalji. <clears throat> My question is, what can be done to encourage the younger Sikh community to join uh, and participate? Because all I can see, uh, even looking at the screen, we are all of mature age, 
and probably uh, are familiar with Sikh faith uh, to a reasonable extent. However, the younger generation is missing out of this congregation who may have benefited from such a lecture as yours or the experiences perhaps described by yourself or others uh, within the society. Um, personally, I have a good experience as well as a bad experience being a Sikh. When I came to the UK in 1964, the head teacher in my school uh, who was fam familiar with Sikhs suggested that if I was ever to uh, temper with my hair, he will exclude me from the school, which was a uh, which was rather encouraging because I stayed a Sikh uh, uh, or continue to be a Sikh. Um, but later on in my life, I experienced the difficulty of finding a job uh, when I was uh, already trained to do a certain amount of work. But that was overcome again by a, um, a employer who saw the, uh, the uh, perhaps the ability to do the job rather than, or seeing beyond the term. But it is not, uh, it's not an unfamiliar story for majority of you, if I tell you, that when people went and uh, asked for employment, they were told the employment has just been filled. And that was part of the, uh, uh, the the um, uh, the discrimination which uh, the younger generation is perhaps facing a little bit less of or, or maybe a lot less of but we don't have to feel guilty about the fact we just have to strive harder uh, and be better at uh, uh, doing things rather than everybody else we can't beat ourselves up as a society and say we'll uh, downtrodden but we don't have to do that, I don't think. What, what would you say that to uh, uh, say to that, Lord Singh? No, I, I, I agree. Uh, first of all, you came in 1964 or whatever. You're a comparative newcomer. Uh, years before, uh, I studied mining engineering in this country, grew up here. And having qualified as a mining engineer in one of the toughest professions, I was told that the, um, at my interview for a mine manager's job, the miners wouldn't like an Indian mine manager. Can you do something else? Go to the scientific department. I mean, that sort of discrimination is there. But we've got the spirit of Chardikala to keep pressing, to find another way, never to give up. And in the, uh, even in the 70s and 80s, when there was still a lot of discrimination, particularly in housing, um, if anyone said anything to me in the office, I'd say, behave yourself, otherwise I'll buy the house next door to you, which would mean that his prices would, uh, the price of his house would stop. We can use humor, humor we can fight, we, but we never give up. Sir, the, the ch uh, Chandi Kala you mentioned is actually a great phase for us Sikhs because it helps us uh, uh, let me backtrack a little bit. When somebody tells me, did you experience uh, uh, prejudice against yourself? And I say, my normal answer is, I am very grateful for the prejudice I suffered because it made me much better than you are. And uh, that actually is, I, I think, Perhaps if life were slightly easier, I don't know where I would have been, but certainly the difficulties within one's early life made one much stronger and robust in whatever one was trying to do. And I would say to today's generation, uh, if anybody feels that they, they've been suppressed, they need to strive a little bit harder to ensure that they can prove to the rest of the generation that they can do much better than anybody else. You know, that right. actually will buy you the place, uh, you know, uh, 
that make it difficult for others to suppress you, I think. Yeah, you, you're right. Adversity does strengthen character if you are prepared to live true to the Sikh teachings. Can I just uh, come, you, come to you, uh, Manjitji? Uh, question of, you know, um, you know, appealing to the youth. We actually, we really go out of our way to attract youth membership and their participation. I, I know, I don't know when you came to our last function, but, you know, we introduced the series of lecture now, and we have a, our BM Singh Memorial Lecture every year where we really give priority to the youth. Um, we started, you know, a sports day, uh, which is barbecue and sports day um, once in a year in summertime. So there are a lot of opportunity and I'm happy to say that two of our, uh, you know, executive members, one being uh, Bupinder, another being, uh, you know, Raminda Chowdhury. And, you know, they, they, we are attracting, but it's not enough. And you, you can see the screen, yes, it's mostly to the people, but they are, you know, we at the same time, you know, that this is being relayed on the YouTube channel, you can't see. But I take it your point, but I really want you, everybody to encourage, you know, your young one to join Puerto Haro Association. We, yeah. we are only 50 years old organization as it is, and a lot of work has been done 50, over the 50 years. And yet, I think more glorious chapters are yet to be written. Uh, and what we really yeah. need is your cooperation. I, think I, I have a confession to make. I didn't even know I was a member of this particular uh, organization until my father passed away on the 11th of April this year. And I was told by Bindaji that I was a member. Uh, what um, I was also a member while my father was a member of this association. He must have introduced me to it. Uh, and presumably the rest of the family. So uh, none of us actually knew the fact that we were member of your organization. So uh, I stand uh, guilty as accused. Uh, I will certainly uh, make sure that I participate in forthcoming lectures or your events. Uh, and as uh, uh, I have tried to attend uh, both of your lectures that I've come across uh, since then. So I will try and continue. And if I can um, uh, work with your uh, organization in any way. Uh, I mean, if you have time in your hand, we're open to the ideas. We really want to, you know, you know, unfortunately, the coronavirus is not helping our celebration of Golden Jubilee of 50 years. But I think we have we are postponing it for the next year. But the preparations are on the way, making a documentary, you know, really. And, you know, we have asked recently everybody just do a two minutes video. What you have been doing uh, in the lockdown condition we will make a documentary and see, look, how we have, you know, gone through the whole process. We got our young general secretary who's been you know, delivering food to, you know, people. So that people have, you know, worked differently and, you know, to see the whole coronavirus thing, you know, successfully. Um, but, and last thing I like just to say, if we haven't, if you're not our on mailing list, please send your, you know, email to us because that's the only way we communicate. And now, you know, I, we, now I am, sir. I, I, I am on your way on this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and um, I, I will uh, make myself available at some stage. Um, uh, I am also part of a uh, Rotary Club, and we are already doing some of the things that uh, as a Sikh person should be doing uh, with the society. And uh, I will certainly extend myself. Uh, uh, we recently we collected know. some funds for, uh, you know, uh, from our side, and we're giving equipment to um, Good Shepherd Bush Gurdwara, who been reaching, you know, 500, um, you know, meals a day uh, during this uh, lockdown condition. So we, we do, but, but we need ideas. We're open to the ideas. Please bring ideas, what we can do, what the community, it is your organization.
you know, we are we are here for each other. And thank you. Can I can I come in? First of all, just to thank the um, uh, the brother for the excellent work that is being done. It needs it, it is being it, it is excellent. It can be expanded, and I'm sure it will be. But there are certain basic things that we have to do. First of all, in our gurdwaras, you you will see young children up to about the five, age of five will come with their parents because their parents drag them. And then later they find excuses not to come, saying we don't understand. There must be much, at least in every service, a explanation uh, or a lecture in English. That, that is important because that is the language they understand. The other thing is when children uh, ask, particularly in Gurdwaras, what about this? They hear something or see something they don't disagree with. They are, they, they are generally told, chup karo Punjabi sikho and so on. That, that's not enough. They must be encouraged to ask questions because the more questions that are asked about Sikhism, the stronger it will be their belief in Sikh teachings that follows. And then there are other um, uh, political things that are dividing the Sikh community. Many young people go to different jathas and sants and babas and that is wrong. We should stress again and again, Guru Manyo Granth, that is the only um, Guru. We follow the Guru's teachings. That is the way to unite. That is the way to bring children in. Ch young children sometimes want something exotic. They'll dress up with bigger Pugnia and so on. That's not Sikhism. We need to encourage them to understand the values of Sikhism. It's very, very simple. I've given a one-page summary. I think I've given it to the General Secretary. That's all that's needed to understand speakers, and you can build from there. Right. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lord Singh. Um, it's been fascinating to listen to you, and uh, we really hope to meet you again um, in person very soon uh, after the lockdown. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone else that took part. Um, and so uh, I think our, our time is finishing. So um, I'd just like to end by thanking everyone um, and uh, bidding you a farewell. Thank you. Thank you.